The planet is heating up. The oceans are becoming filled with plastic. Change starts now. Change starts now. We're on a countdown. To zero waste. Five, four, three, two, one. This is the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast. Here's your host, Laura Nash. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Zero Waste Countdown podcast and radio show. Our guest today is author and environmental policy writer Michael Schellenberger. In 2008, he was named a Time Magazine Hero of the Environment. He's also the co-founder of the Breakthrough Institute and author of Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hey, thanks for having me, Laura. I want to ask you about plastic because you did a whole chapter on it, and this is sort of right up our alley. So we know that plastic can kill animals directly, like turtles and whales. They can eat bags. It can cause like digestive blockages. Uh, So we know that that's bad. But can you tell us how plastic is actually saving animals around the world? Well, yeah, I mean, this is, um, you know, so I wrote Apocalypse Never, and it's really, you know, three separate sections or three parts. The first part is a debunking of popular environmental myths. The second part is about how humans actually save nature, which is something we don't hear enough about. We just hear about how we destroy the natural environment. And then the third Mm -hmm. section asks the question of why, if environmental problems are serious but manageable, did we come to see them as the end of the world? And that's the end of the book. But so the first part of the book, I knew when I wrote it that when we had the idea of the book that I had to do a chapter on plastic waste and I, but the truth is I had never looked into it. So I've written a lot on energy and the environment. I've even done more on agriculture, but really plastic waste was the freshest topic I came to. And so in some ways it's like the most beginning mind chapter, (laughs) if you know that expression from Buddhism, um, which is that there's a, there's a sort of beginner mind, which is an ignorant mind in some ways, but also has almost a quality of openness to it. I think that, that I just admit would be harder to get at this point on like nuclear and renewables. So for me, so I read all the books, you know, I read all the made books on plastics. And finally, I somehow, I just love New York Times' archive search function. I've spent time on there on energy and I got some, I, whatever I just hit me, I was like, I really need to just go read more about the history of plastics um, through the newspapers because I just wasn't getting it from from the books and that, was, that I had um, and that I think are available on this history. But the most amazing moment <laughs> was because I'm sitting here, I'm profiling Christine Figener, who's this German marine biologist in Costa Rica mm-hmm. who creates this amazing viral video of herself pulling something out of the nose of a sea turtle in Costa Rica with her Costa Rican um, shipmates. And, you know, it's been viewed like whatever by half the planet at this point. And I, so she's, I wanted to profile her. So she's really the character that runs through the whole chapter. I think that was also only because I'd never written on this before. And, sh- and she didn't really, you know, know who I was. I didn't know who she was. So we were also this whole, you know, it's a 90 minute phone call that she and I ended up having. A lot of it's in that chapter. You know, so here I am reading the New York Times archives. And I discover that, of course, in the history of plastics, that they used sea turtle shells to make plastic. And I think part of the reason more people don't know that is because we call them tortoise shell glasses or tortoise shell design. In fact, my glasses I am literally wearing right now is maybe the most tortoise shell is maybe the most common glasses style. It's like the pattern, right? Like of your frames? Yeah, it's like the back of a, it's like the back of a sea turtle (laughs) or Hmm. of any really reptile. I mean, it's got the light, the kind of the tan, from tan to, to a very dark brown, I think Mm -hmm. would do the word you would use or sort of dappling. Mm -hmm. So those are tortoise shell glasses. Now it turns out it's not a tortoise, it's sea turtle. It's the hawksbill sea turtle, which is not the one that had the plastic up its nose, but is indeed one of the turtles that. Laura Figener works with and and is um, this endangered, this incredible, beautiful, and stunning, of course, species that was endangered because they hunted the heck out of them. And, and then the twist of it all. So, okay, so anyway, the punchline, the main punchline is that 
the creation of plastics made from fossil fuels were the substitute for the plastic that we were making from tortoise shell, from actual sea turtle shell. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, these horrible plastics, including the ones that get stuck up the noses of sea turtles, were, were critical to to saving the sea turtles, which are now coming back. They're still critically endangered, I believe, according to IUCN, but but nonetheless are coming back. Um, and I think one of the most interesting twists to it all, and is a theme in the book, Apocalypse Never, is that after you create the artificial substitute, the wealthiest people in the society, like the people that are interested in really fine things, actually value the natural product more. And so think of how we how like rich people don't want like a uh, fake fur. You know, if you mm -hmm. want to get a fur, you want to get a real fur for the most part, right? Or how um, you want genuine leather or or in the case of the Chinese right now, or it's hopefully being beaten back, they want genuine ivory. In the case of the sea turtle, even after we had created this alternative, Japanese consumers continue to favor the natural sea turtle over the artificial plastic tortoiseshell style. So yeah, I mean, that's the story. And it's this crazy story. And it's one of these little discoveries where I realized that nobody had really told that story before, and that I would be the first to get to tell it. And it's one of my favorite chapters in the book. It's my wife's favorite chapter in the book. Oh, good. Most of the book is not about plastic waste, but I think it's a, it's telling us something important, which I think is that we actually have to learn as human beings to value the artificial thing whether it's furs, plastics, you know, the alternative to whale oil is petroleum and vegetable oil. We have to learn to love artificial fish, uh, farmed fish. And that that's, for some reason, that is hard for us as a whole species. It's hard for Japanese people. It's hard for Americans. But I think that's one of the most profound things is that that's how we save nat what's natural in the world. And, and that was, I think, one of the most important punchlines to that chapter. Yeah. And... I would say I got the vibe from the book that plastic in the ocean might not be as bad as we think, even though you do mention that it, it can kill some animals directly, but it also saves, uh, you know, plastic saves other animals, of course. But there are bigger issues we should be worried about with the ocean, right? We should probably be worried about overfishing. And, and that's where the fish farms come in, right? So if you buy farm fish, then you're not going out and taking the wild fish that maybe isn't being monitored so much and uh, being able to, to thrive that way, right? Yeah, I mean, I would, I, I, was, I was curious where I would come out on this issue of how bad is the plastic waste, right? Mm -hmm. I thought I might end up thinking it was more overblown than I think I ended up finding it in the sense that you know, we do see high levels of mortality with some species that consume a lot of plastic waste, including sea turtles. Um, in Brazil, they did a big study and there was a very high mortality. And, you know, you see it with whales yeah. and, and albatross and birds. And I discuss all that. So I didn't want to certainly suggest that it's not a problem because I think it is. And I think I, what I did want to say, though, is that I don't think it's as big of a problem as overfishing or as bycatch, which mm -hmm. I think are are bigger problems, or frankly, then as habitat loss. I guess you could count those as three separate things. It's all interrelated in some sense. But yeah, I'd say overfishing, bycatch. Bycatch is like, you know, when the case here is the albatross, they would use these long fishing lines, you know, these industrial fishing ships, they use these long lines and they'd have meat, you know, on them mm -hmm. to uh, catch, I guess, tuna or big fish, right? Um, with these big hooks, like, but with meat, with seafood on the hooks. And the albatrosses would fly down and and try to eat the meat, and they would end up getting hooked and killed. Mm. Terrible. And they were able to actually solve that problem with a pretty simple, I think, by just changing when they dropped the lines. They were able to prevent almost all that bycatch of albatross. But, you know, certainly like, you know, for species like the albatross, the the guts full of plastic waste, it's terrible. But when they just get killed by the fishing line, they're just killed, right? The fishing weight, they, they can actually live with a fair amount of plastic waste in them and they can defecate a fair amount of it out. I mean, I think mm -hmm. the nightmare thing that everybody worries about with plastic waste, certainly I, in going into this even, is just that it lasts forever. But that's not true. Mostly nature still dilutes stuff. I mean, the first lesson from my ecological biology class now 30 years ago was 
you know, dilution is the solution to pollution. That's like the first thing you <laughs> learn. Later, as a radical lefty, I would say revolution is the solution to pollution. But that turned out to be wrong, too, because socialist revolutions did not end up being particularly good for the environment. Um, it's like it's like there's so much bad stuff that happens to sea life. And it's this thing we all ignore because we like to eat fish and we don't ever go out into the ocean. And it's really hard to photograph. You know, and I think that the blue plant, you know, the ocean planet series on of those nature documentaries are probably much less watched than the land based ones. There's just a bias because we're land creatures. But for sure, like the oceans are hammered in a way that I think most people don't really appreciate. That's interesting because I, I used to serve in the Navy and we used to say there was maritime blindness for the rest of the country. Like most of the country didn't know that we even existed or what we did right. or anything. So that's weird that it would be the same way in sustainability, um, that there's just a yeah. time blindness. You did mention styrofoam, uh, how it's broken down. Styrofoam can break down, basically, is what I read. And this was actually shocking. This was one of the most coolest things that I read. But styrofoam is broken down, apparently, in the ocean uh, into organic carbon and carbon dioxide in sunlight and seawater, which I found fascinating. Yeah, for sure. Scientists go out and they, they try to count all the plastic in the ocean. I mean, they just and they do pretty good counts, pretty good at it. They do thorough counts, like multiple counts. Anyway, they can find 0.1% of world annual production on the sea surface, all kinds of plastics. Okay, so 99.9% so of annual production disappears and what you're left with on the surface of the ocean, which is the thing that really is bad and that grosses us out for good reason, mm -hmm. is the floating plastic waste because that's what the animals can eat and whatever. But that means that 99.9% .9 is sinking to the bottom or being eaten and pooped out. <laughs> this yeah. is the, fam the family show, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and um, as microplastics, Mm -hmm. But then they, and then you go, okay, but then the, then the oceans are just full of all these microplastics. It's just filled with all this plastic, you know, like bad, smaller plastic, worse. Well, no, they found a hundred times less microplastic <laughs> than they thought they were going to find. So, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, look, I think this stuff triggers OCD. You know, I mean, one of the things I didn't quite write a, in detail about, I had all these strands that I had to just cut short where I had science, but I have seen enough evidence now, particularly of adolescent girls being upset by plastic waste, I think it's triggering OCD. And I think what triggers it is the sense in which, you know, we're just turning the whole planet into a garbage dump and we're killing all the animals that way. And that picture is just wrong, you know, and that if now, now I think then the flip side is if they really are worried about sea life, they should be promoting farmed fish. It's like the most important thing and nobody talks about it. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, we do talk about it a lot in Canada because the Suzuki Foundation is very against farm fish. So we're told in Canada over and over not to eat farm fish. That's nuts. Um, yeah. So it's tough. There's so many like different pieces of information coming at us. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, teenage girls are worried about this stuff because I, I just don't think we're going to solve anything when we're in a panic mode. So if we're panicking about like dying in 10 years due to climate change, uh, I don't know how you're going to go get a degree in science and like build things that make the world more sustainable or, or, you know, do good things. So I think it's really bad. And I don't really like the climate, like panic and anxiety and stuff. Um, I just think it's, bad for people and especially for children like I don't think children should grow up like thinking that everything is so horrible and I appreciate you kind of taking this turn of like oil and gas is important <laughs> because it it actually could clean up the whole planet very well by leaving these natural spaces so I I liked your journey in the Congo and you were talking about people who are like subsistence farmers and there's this movement of like the developed world to be like, oh, no, you shouldn't use oil and gas. But if these people use oil and gas, then they could probably build like a waste management facility to like stop all this stuff going into the water. Um, and if right. they're lifting out of poverty, it's just like better. So I really liked that angle. For sure. Yeah. And uh, I feel like I support nuclear now. And I did before, but I didn't know too much about it. And I really liked how you kind of walked us through everything. Like you start with burning wood and then there's charcoal 
But you also said it's not linear, right? Um, and, you know, it goes on to, we mentioned whale oil and then liquid natural gas and like we're fracking now. So like the technology goes up. Like is nuclear the last step? Do you think countries could skip some of the dirtier fossil fuel stages and go to nuclear or do they need to build up their technology first? That's a really interesting question, Laura. When you were in the nuclear Navy, so... Oh, we don't have nuclear. We don't have nuclear in Canada. You guys do. Oh, 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 right. Of course. Uh, We had an American nuclear submarine in our base, like in our military harbor. And I had to walk like the CBC. I think the Ottawa, Ottawa Citizen were there, like some big newspapers nationally. And I was told do not let them see the submarine. And so I had to walk them through the base. And there was this part where you could see in between the buildings where the conning tower was sticking up with the American flag. And I was just like, and to your left, if you look over here, you will see this building, you know, because apparently protesters would come and it would just be this giant news nightmare for the military if it was known that we were harboring a nuclear submarine. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, people are scared. I mean, yeah, yeah. In some ways, it's the heart of the book, and it's the heart of what my argument about nuclear is. It's the thing that the nuclear industry and I disagree about. It's the thing that nobody can talk about. It's sort of, it's so taboo, nuclear. Not just the energy, but the weapons and the whole thing around it. It's so taboo. People don't know why even. I had a reporter in Argentina. It was the most interesting thing. He kind of goes, what about all the secrecy? you know, with nuclear energy. And I was like, well, what do you, what do you mean? Like the plants themselves, like a nuclear power plant in the United States, I'm assuming it's the same in Canada. I'm sure it is. Has like two government regulators there who are there to just like, if any worker is like, Hey, I don't feel safe or this doesn't feel safe. There's there to respond to. There's no other industry that has that. Like Mm -hmm. we know all of the piping. I mean, it's not like they're hiding like how the plant heats water and spins a turbine or something, or then they're hiding how fission works, which is atom splitting. We've known that since the, you know, since obviously since the thirties. So what's the secret? Well, he couldn't say because they're, he doesn't even know. And, and, and so, but so you kind of go, well, what's going on here? You know, this is, you know, the secret that there's an American sub that's, that's, that's patrolling Canadian waters. Don't the Canadians know that, you know, and, and this thing of, we're going to hide this and, Mm-hmm. I think it all just, that's why the chapter is called, uh, the nuclear chapter, as you know, because you read it, is called Saving Nature is Bomb, <laughs> 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 which is kind of my, it's my, because, you know, my son is 21 and much, much cooler than I ever was, you know. <laughs> um, I was like, you sure it's not nuclear power, it's, you sure it's not Saving Nature is the bomb? Because that's how I had remembered it. But he's like, no, 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 the cool kids say it is, is just bomb. There's no the in front of it. So... <laughs> That's the idea was like that the secret thing is just not a secret. We all know that that's, and obviously that's why a bunch of people are afraid of it or have made themselves afraid of it, which I think is more what happened for ideological reasons. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, the answer to your question is, by the way, your first question is, can you just, can everybody leapfrog to nuclear? It'll be hard for this book, you know, as you know, has this theme of the Congo in it. It'll be hard for Congo to do that. They don't Mm -hmm. have enough scientists and engineers to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, Indonesia can do it. It's a middle income country and certainly all the rich countries could do it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, so to some extent, the very low levels, there's an engineering obstacle, which is that, yeah, you want to have engineers that have worked with coal plants before or hydroelectric dams or natural gas or oil before. Mm -hmm. So there is to some extent. And broadly, the picture I want to paint in the book, as you know, is that there's a benevolent, and physical hierarchy, energy hierarchy, which goes from wood and dung to using coal and hydroelectric dams to using natural gas and petroleum to using uranium for nuclear. That that's every step along the way, there's less pollution, less carbon, there's greater safety every step along that process, even though people may not think so. It's much safer to use nuclear than to use wood or coal, which by now a lot of people know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that's a benevolent. And so you kind of go any direction. So people say to me, Michael, are you for natural gas or against it? And I say, you're not even asking the question in the right way, because my view is natural gas is good when it replaces coal, but it's bad when it replaces nuclear. That's it. Mm-hmm. Like you take me 15 years to get to such simple view, but that is my simplest view. 
I don't, unless the nuclear plant is unsafe for some reason, which we don't really see because governments regulate it well, incredibly mm. too well, over over regulate it. But the issue just is the issue, which is the bomb issue, which is that, you know, to some extent, if you have scientists and technicians and engineers who know how to split atoms to give off heat to power a nuclear plant, then to some extent you have the capacity to make a bomb. Doesn't mean that you're gonna make a bomb, doesn't make you want to make a bomb. If you want to make a bomb, you've got good reasons to want to make a bomb. Like you are afraid of basically being invaded. That's like, you know, or or you, or, you know, to some case, there's some of these guys that make the argument, it didn't even make it into the book, but there's some extent which some countries, maybe it's prestige, but nonetheless, it's such a dangerous weapon. It's such a powerful weapon. It scares the living daylights out of us for good reason, because it's mm-hmm. so powerful that it freaks us out that it also is a way to make nuclear power and it's a way to freak people out. And that's the major, that's the main event with nuclear and that the nuclear engineers and industry, they don't want that to be the case, but it is and will inevitably be for a very long period of time, or at least until people get over their hangups about it. And so what this book is trying to do is sort of say that's at at the center of, of Apocalypse Never is this apocalyptic fear of nuclear And to some extent, you can't understand anything else, including like fears of too many people, fears of climate change, fears that we're too rich, you know, fears that GMOs could kill us all. You can't really understand any of those fears without understanding that primal fear of nuclear. Well, you mentioned in the book that once people have the bomb, it's like they're never going to use it because the enemy also has the bomb and it's like redundant. If you blow up your enemy, your enemy's going to blow up you. And then that's that, right? Right. So we've had this, you said it perfect. You said it better than, than, than the political scientists say it. They use a very fancy term, which is deterrence. Deterrence is just, of course, it's because they're academic snobs. They invent this term. Um, Deterrence is just French for to scare away. That's all it means, to scare away. So at the heart of the technology, this is what makes it such an interesting technology. I, I still, you can tell, I, I this book was about nuclear, by the way. So I, you know, and then it changed and it became this broader book, but you can tell I still, I, I, I think nuclear is so interesting sort of psychologically. Like the technology became so powerful that the way it worked changed. So if I say, for example, I think nuclear weapons were being used in the recent India China conflict. Oh. And then people will say the people will hear that and they'll think, wait, but the nuclear weapons weren't they weren't used, they weren't detonated. No, no, they weren't detonated, but they were used. So the reason nobody has heard about the India China war this year. Oh, I have. <laughs> you know, right. Um, is because they didn't allow it to escalate and they didn't allow it to escalate because of deterrence, right? Because oh. they know that their consequences are super high. So it almost has a kind of force field effect. It's, it's a strange, strange weapon. We've misunderstood. Most of us have misunderstood it for 75 years, which is the anniversary of the bomb. And some people, a handful of them, including Niels Bohr, who won the Nobel prize for physics and was one of the, one of the inventors of it to some extent, really to the side was one of the, he understood what the weapon was in 1945, a group of scholars at Yale understood what it was in 1945. And then most of the world's governments, the world's people have in one way or another denied kind of the essential reality of this weapon, which is first, it's never going away. It can't go away. It can't, we can't rid ourselves of it even if we wanted to, and I don't think we do, I think it's, that's obvious. We don't want to, Um, but we couldn't get rid of it for, for inherent, for reasons inherent to the technology, which is that two countries that had it, got rid of it, went to war, would race to build it. And you would be at much higher risk of it being detonated (laughs) and used in its worst purpose rather than used for its best purpose, its highest purpose, which is to prevent war. Mm -hmm. And that reality is so shocking, still sounds shocking to say it, but that nuclear weapons are a technical fix to war is the truth that nobody dares speak. And I obviously did in Apocalypse Never. To some extent, nobody's dealt with it yet because there's so many other controversial things in the book. 
but it's at the heart of, I think, the fears of the bomb and, and also thus at the um, acceptance of the bomb. Because once you accept that the bomb's not going, I'm sorry, not of the bomb, of the energy source. Because once you accept that the bomb's not going away, then, then, you, ex then you kind of go, well, I guess we might as well make the best of it, which is to use this incredible energy and which I argue is the only energy that can fully decarbonize high energy industrial societies like ours. And thus, if you have any concern about climate change, even the slightest concern is, is the best technology and one that we should eventually be using a hundred percent of, you know, at some, I don't know if it's 2100, but, or 2200, but at some point in the future, it, it will be, I think the, the main, the main event, the one that everybody gets to use and enjoy. So you, you say in the book, obviously, that, that nuclear is saving the environment in terms of nuclear power because it's so clean and we can store the waste so easily. I've, I've seen the pictures that you posted of uh, nuclear On Twitter, uh, right? yeah. storage. It's, it's like nicer than some of our schools. Like it's a really nice looking building. Yes. It looks very safe. Um, but I also yeah. think, I, I kind of just thought of this, that in a way, the nuclear bomb has kind of saved the environment as well hear me out though uh because it's prevented probably so much war and i feel like war could just do so much environmental destruction because it brings things like famine so people will go and you know cut down the forest and take all the animals and um it's just a lot of destruction so i guess that's kind of an interesting point as well that yeah the power is saving the environment but maybe holding the bombs is a little bit too i don't know <laughs> well, right. And then so one, one of the questions is, if the bomb resulted in peace between the U.S. and Soviet Union and the U.S. and China and China and the Soviet Union and now Pakistan and India and now China and India, and then maybe between South Korea and North Korea and between the United States and North Korea, then you've got the problem, which everybody fears, which is you kind of go, well, wait a second. It sounds like what you're saying is that when the bomb spreads, it is accompanied by peace. And then you're in a very awkward situation for a couple for many different reasons, one of which is purely psychological, which is it's kind of shocking and depressing to some extent, or it could be depressing, that the only way that humans achieved peace was through a bomb. If you thought that the ways that humans should or could achieve peace was through brotherly love and reason, then I think the bomb is a big disappointment. And I think it's an interesting, I didn't quite, again, it's funny, I didn't quite get into exactly in the book, but you know, if you have a, um, a strong idea that brotherly love and reason are the solutions you know, to our problems on earth, and then a technical, a technology, solves it there's a way in which it's kind of, it's really disappointing and sort of sad you know what you think it might say about about humans on the other hand yeah for me i look at our species and i look at the past and i go oh my gosh it's so violent and now you know it was so violent you know i mean all the way through world war ii and certainly after to some extent but What's remarkable is how war is, is basically ending everywhere. So then the, then the more practical question is, well, does that mean that other countries should get the bomb? And of course, like, you know, I could like be, I feel like I could get my citizenship revoked, you know, if I say nobody can prevent them, nobody has been able to prevent them. And I don't know. I mean, you know, you kind of go, if Iraq had the bomb in 2000, in 2000, then the United States wouldn't have invaded Iraq. So you kind of go, is that where it's headed? Didn't quite get there in the book, you know, certainly not this book, but, um, you know, it just raises a bunch of awkward questions. You know, right now, the official story by the United States government and every Western government in the world is a lie, which is that we are going to get rid of our nuclear weapons. That is the official position of the United States government and that we're making progress toward it. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, it means that the non-proliferation treaty, which we got everybody to sign basically in the world, including many of the ones that then went on to get bombs or trying to get a bomb, like that says that we are all committed to getting rid of nuclear weapons. It's just ridiculous. Like there's nobody in the US government that thinks any position of power that, that thinks that the United States 
is trying to get rid of its bombs, is intended to get rid of its nuclear bombs. Colin Powell, when he talked about them at one point, I think he called them the crown jewel of the U.S. military. I mean, it's obviously the best weapon. So there's no chance in the world that the United States is going to get rid of them. And so that means that non-proliferation treaty is based on a lie, or at least where one party is clearly not sincere about upholding um, our side of the agreement. So, you know, it's very possible that this reversion towards nationalism that's occurring is going to result in more proliferation. It may very well be happening with Iran. People have always panicked about that. And the fact is, you know, it's very hard to get a bomb still. Nobody, none of the countries that have bombs want other countries to get bombs. They give them a really hard time. They make it very difficult for them to get them. They end up spreading pretty slowly. You know, I'm always struck like it's like, you know, there's only, you know, nine nuclear powers still. So, you know, if it were 20 by 2050, I don't think that's the end of the world. And I think that the apocalyptic sense in which more countries getting nuclear weapons increases the likelihood of war has been proven wrong like multiple times. And so this basic fear that this technology has faced, you know, which is totally separate from whether nuclear energy is good for the country to have the bomb, of course. But the basic fear that I, I think has existed has been wrong. But I also kind of go, you know, it may take us another 25 years or so to finally kind of come to peace with this reality because it's just so shocking for, for mm-hmm. I think, for a lot of people. So the, the nuclear waste, do you know how long it typically lasts? It's like thousands of years. I know that there's like a half-life. Here's what I think um, my basic understanding is that, is that even after 100 years, it's pretty low radioactivity. In other words... I was standing right next. I mean, you can go right up to those casts. So I, I think you were referring to I, on the over the weekend. I tweeted all of the nuclear waste in the Netherlands in this pretty small building, right? This which is painted orange is so beautiful and has got big E equals MC squared paint on the side, which is so classy and so Dutch. And they had like carpets hanging on the walls, like for decoration. <laughs> oh, ancient tapestries, right? I mean, old beautiful pieces of art that are in that climate controlled controlled environment. So we have these photos of people, you know, uh, that look like they're attending a museum exhibit because they're looking at these tapestries, but behind them are these, is what we call nuclear waste, which is just these used nuclear fuel rods encased in steel and cement. So you can very safely be next to that. And I think after a hundred years, I don't know the exact numbers and it doesn't really matter, but after a hundred years, the radioactivity is even lower. And then, you know, 10,000 years, it's like, can you still detect some radioactivity? Yeah, but that's probably true for a lot of things, right? So who Mm -hmm. cares? Um, And more importantly, they're just going to be in the cement and steel canisters. So, so, so as from a waste point of view, why would anybody be worried about that? Like, there's Mm -hmm. no reason, like you should be worried about so many, every other kind of waste in the world before you worry about it, the nuclear waste is the solution. It is what is left over after we're producing gigantic quantities of energy. No other energy source leaves behind so little waste. No other energy source contains all of its own waste in such a small area of land. It's of zero Mm. concern or consequence. There are so many more dangerous forms of waste in the world, including human waste. It's a complete, it's just ridiculous. From an environmental point of view, it's exactly what you want. So then you have to ask the question, why does everybody think it's some great big thing or some great dangerous thing? And again, I just come back to, I think people think they're like little bombs. I think, you know, you get to the Simpsons and they leak. I had a former, very senior Democrat, Democratic politician tell me that he was worried that nuclear waste could leak. Nuclear waste is solid metal fuel rods. It does not leak. There's nothing to leak. How does anybody even imagine that, right? Um, and the book, I talk a little bit about how anti-nuclear people created that little bit of propaganda, which was which was basically by confusing things in the minds of people around the hot, clean water that comes out of nuclear plants, totally clean, mm-hmm. cleaner than it goes in, <laughs> you know, um, water, because it goes through this hot thing. It's not radioactive. It's just clean water. And the environmental, anti-nuclear environmental groups in the 60s started attacking the water, calling it thermal thermal pollution. 
And the pollution they were referring to referred to the thermal, which just means warm. It just means hot water. Well, what we see, in fact, near nuclear plants around the world, including in Florida, and I think there's another one in the south, I can't remember exactly where, is that it's habitat for manatees and an endangered, I want to say, alligator. God, I can never get them right. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I'm such a bad naturalist. Um, you know, but basically, like, the hot water in many places is desirable by marine species, you know, I've had this, I've sort of laid this out before, by the way, on social media, and I've had people say, well, that just, you know, you're, it's still, it's unnatural or something, you know, it's like, come on, there's hot water that comes out of the earth in many places. Like, have you heard of Yellowstone? I mean, it's bizarre that with things that people think are natural versus unnatural. Anyway, you get down to it. It's literally nuclear. The energy source itself is so beautiful. I mean, if you think it's ugly, if you think the weapon is ugly, and I don't even know that I do anymore, but if you think the weapon is ugly, the energy source is by far the most beautiful energy source. It's literally there's no smoke. There's I mean the coal ash ponds that that sometimes break open and contaminate riverways. The mountains that have been destroyed for coal mining. Um, uranium mining, it's now done like entirely below the surface of the earth. They shoot hot water into the earth. Out comes this miraculous element called uranium um, that they then just kind of process a little bit. They make into these rods, these metal rods. They become hot for a couple of years in the reactor. They're then cooled in normal water that people can fall into, indeed swim into, without harm because water is such a good, um, it's such so good at protecting people from radiation. It then goes and, and then goes and sits in these steel and metal canisters, these steel and cement canisters, and you can look at works of art and drink wine and eat cheese right next to them and you're fine. There's just no other energy source that comes close to that level of environmental performance. And nobody knows it, nobody talks about it. And, and even a fair number of people that do know about it still find something deeply wrong with it. And I just think that's, you know, I just kind of go, that's just because our consciousness is still in infant mode around this technology. You know, the more you learn about it, the more it just seems like a kind of miracle that we get to have it, that we get to use this rather than burning wood, burning coal, burning fossil fuels of any kind. Yeah. And I, I think like wind and solar are problematic because first of all, they don't contribute very much to the grid. And then, you know, in 10 or 20 years, we have to landfill them because a lot of them aren't good for, for anything else. And then also you need the backup of natural gas. I think you went into all this in the, the book. Uh, so I think nuclear, nuclear just kind of covers all that stuff and gets rid of all that extra like building and mining for things that go into wind and solar and, um, and can probably power like bigger grids. So if if people are listening and they want to get involved in a pro nuclear movement, what do you recommend? Yeah, well, I, first of all, I totally you're you're totally right about the about renewables. The point I make in the book is that you know we don't have the industrial revolution without fossil fuels. It's only made possible by moving from wood to coal. Um, renewables mm -hmm. can't power modern industrial societies, and they can't power them because they don't produce enough energy. And so what the problem with, you know, even industrial modern solar and wind farms require three to 400 times more land than a natural gas or a nuclear plant. That's an astonishing amount of land. And people will say to me, but we have plenty of land. Well, not if you care about it. Not if you actually care about the environment. We don't have plenty of land. Mm -hmm. You know, the estimates I use, which is from Václav Smil, who is widely reviewed as one of the leading energy analysts in the world, who Bill Gates says he looks forward to more than any other person's books, he calculates that that we would need to go from using the current half a percent of land right now for energy to using between 25 and 50 percent of all of our land for energy production if we did 100 percent renewables. That's just madness. But of course, you and it's yeah. true, and you see it at the at the basic level of the of the increased amount of land that's used. 17 times more materials required to make solar energy than nuclear per unit of energy. That's just steel, glass, concrete, just simple stuff. But it's a lot of mining, a lot of quarries that are terrible for the environment. And then the waste. Solar produces two to 300 times more waste than nuclear. So you're just dealing with wow. huge, huge throughput. So, you know, I've got we I, we are part of two movements, true movements now. Um, one is pro-nuclear 
We had 30 cities around the world last year did events advocating for nuclear. This year, it'll be I think it'll be over 40. Each of them is becoming much more aggressive, much more exciting, and much better as time goes on. Um, just around the world, these are ordinary citizens. It's not the nuclear industry, though, of course, we always invite the nuclear power plant workers to come. Um, but this is just us ordinary folks. And then there's a separate movement that's advocate that's fighting these big industrial wind projects that are killing endangered birds and bats all over the United States and Europe. That movement is separately organized. In some ways, I think it's bigger. You know, these are conservationists. These are people protecting communities. So both of those movements exist. And folks can just email me, Michael Schellenberger at gmail.com if they want more information or um, or just follow us on, on follow me on Twitter. And there's a bunch of stuff today. We just announced the nuclear advocacy and next week we're going to announce the renewables movement the renewables movement the and i mean the anti-industrial renewables movement oh, okay cool yeah raising these it really i don't know what else to call it the concept they, it, they call themselves the energy and wildlife coalition so like kind of against wind and solar uh, against the industrial wind and solar i don't think any of us care okay. about having solar panels on your roof mm -hmm. but you know they just approved this just massive project today in the Mojave, can't remember the exact square miles, the Gemini project. And it's like, it's going to just devastate desert tortoise habitat. It's just massive okay. amounts of space. So those folks are, those conservationists are being organized. Um, and so they can, anyway, people can contact me about both. I remember looking at solar panels and it was about $30,000 and there was a bank that would loan you for like 2.5% or something, the 30,000. But the solar company couldn't guarantee that I'd be producing enough energy to sell back to the grid to cover the cost of the principal plus the interest of the loan. Like they said, it should cover it. And I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> like, if you can't guarantee that it's going to pay for itself, like, I'm not going to take that loan out in my name. And so I didn't end up getting them. And, and then after kind of learning about all this stuff, I think that I probably made the right decision, like for my money, first of all, but also like we have a nuclear plant here on our grid. So kind of why would I, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask you like quickly about fast fashion, because I actually really loved that part of the book as well. Thank and you. you said something that totally goes against like things that we've talked about on the show before, because usually we talk about fast fashion being bad, but this is like completely opposite about what you're saying. So could you just talk a little bit about why fast fashion is actually a good thing? Yeah, I mean, this is, um, you know, I, I talk about how when I was in my 20s, I helped organize this big campaign against Nike for its factory conditions in Asia for its so-called sweatshops. And I'm very proud of that effort because it was it was incredibly successful, like, you know, resulted in really a huge boycott against Nike. It really damaged their brand. Um, part of that was their fault. They were really insensitive and unresponsive. But, you know, I, I know enough now about like, you know, that basically as people become wealthy, we stop being small farmers and we often move to cities and work in factories. And then the kids of the factory workers get educations and go to college and become service or knowledge workers. And that's just kind of what development is. There's not a lot more complicated to it. And, and we forget the fact that that we use less land to grow more food as we become wealthier. You know, that in fact, in rich countries, the amount of land that we use for agriculture has gone way down. In fact, the amount of land we use globally for meat production is way down. And that's a that's about a quarter of the Earth's ice-free surface is just pasture, human pasture. We use about half of the ice-free surface of the Earth, you know, of which only, you know, a half a percent is for cities and a half a percent is for energy. So really it's all about food production. So anything you can do to grow food more efficiently is good for the natural environment. And and I tell the story of a factory worker in Indonesia because I went there and I spent some time with her and I talked about her life. Well, of course she didn't want to go back to the farm. I mean, life was hard. You know, she was mistreated by the Barbie in the Barbie factory, <laughs> um, but she was able to quit and get a new job in a chocolate factory and work as hard. But, you know, she had, by the time she was 22, she owned her own house. She owned her own motor scooter, flat screen TV. She was able to cook with LPG rather than wood, you know, it's a, it's a, the book is covers a bunch of my life. So it was five us five years ago. Now I went. And so now she's got a married with a child and, and much better life than the, the, the hero of the story from the Congo, um, Bernadette, who is also 
here. Bernadette would love to have the life of this Indonesian factory worker. So yeah, and then of course in the countryside, there's fewer people there to work the farms, but that's okay because they're using more modern agricultural techniques and then they're able to grow more food on less land. And, you know, I just talk about how, you know, in the past we all used to be farmers, you know, whatever, 90% of us. And now 2% of us are farmers and that's just all progress is. So, and, and that's all, that's how we save the environment because our farms require 10%, then 20%, then 30%, then, then half as much land. And, you know, when it comes to thing like, things like meat production, really, you just, you know, in many cases, you need 1% of the land that we dedicate to pasture. So you can have, ha you know, and that's just such a big driver of, of the destruction of habitat for endangered species is, is meat production that's pasture for, for livestock and, and animals. So, so yeah, that's how, that's why I say sweatshops, Sweatshops, what do I say? Sweatshops save the environment or something is the name well, of that title. It was, yeah, it was fast fashion. Uh, and and that was, you know, it, it changed my view on it a little bit because it was basically like saying, yeah, it's fast fashion, but you're supporting so many factory workers who actually have good jobs, who wouldn't have good jobs if it wasn't for those factories. And it's allowing them to leave the land alone a little bit. Like they, they're not off fighting baboons over yams, you know, they're in a city they're not killing the environment or burning wood you know they're actually like working decent jobs um well hopefully that, that that's of course a a concern too is that they're being treated well like you said with the barbie plant and stuff um but that's sort of what i got from the fast fashion is that there is this kind of human side to it that it, it can be good for people absolutely yeah by fast fashion it's it helps poor countries develop and work themselves out of poverty. It's the only way we know how for, for small, uneducated farmers to raise their living standards. Unless you're Saudi Arabia and you go right from being, you know, nomadic or, or, or indigenous or, or small farmer populations into being wealthy people. And there's not that many of those countries. We need to be supporting products made in poor countries. And that's often what fast, that's just al almost always where fast fashion comes from. Mm -hmm. We're just worried about the waste part of it. Um, um, you know, which, which waste part of like the clothes themselves? Well, you know, they last for like six months and then you just kind of have to throw them out because they're like kind of bad quality. Yeah. I mean, but that's, and so, yeah. And for sure, cotton, cotton, I guess, wool, you know, synthetic fabrics, you're sequestering carbon. <laughs> if we can recycle the cotton, that'd be great. You know, we are, there's some things I point out we're able to, some things are easier to, are, are more profitable to recycle than others, right? Like aluminum cans and, yeah. and, and glass, um, but they all mm -hmm. require energy. And so the direction is definitely towards, you know, you get more energy, more recycling. You know, I probably, I mean, to be honest, I don't buy enough fast fashion, but I, but I wanted to, cause I don't really like buying clothes in general, but um, I definitely think there's also just an OCD thing about it where there's some sense and some disconnection too, where really some sense in which, you know, that buying fast fashion was somehow oppressing women or harming the environment when I think the dynamic has mostly been the other way. So sure, it'd be great to have less land growing cotton, but the benefits of fast fashion and and adding value to that cotton and wool and other materials, you know, by these women is the big driver of what allows for reducing the amount of land used for food and this benevolent process of, of, I think, lifting people out of poverty. So I, I, I hear you, but I don't, I don't know that it, I don't think it takes away from the, the overall benefits. Mm -hmm. And as they develop, they will get like cleaner processes for making things and higher wages and, and stuff. It'll just keep going up and up. Right. I think. Well, for sure. I mean, just look at the difference of Germany. I mean, just look at Germany's factories compared to Indonesia's, you know, and to be fair to Indonesia, theirs have gotten much better too. You know, and I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure the Ethiopian factories are worse than the Indonesian factories, which are probably worse than the the German factories, you know, but eventually, you know, a world where cheap nuclear power is powering the factories and, you know, genetically modified seeds and really efficient irrigation systems are growing your cotton and, you know, and the, and the footprint is shrinking, you know, the amount of waste is, is I think, pretty marginal compared to the benefits of, of all of that intensification. Mm -hmm. Well, 
The book was wonderful to read. It really opened my eyes to a lot of things that I'm interested in. I really enjoyed the chapter on plastic, and I think the message was fairly positive that we we have a bright future as long as we, you know, work hard toward it. So it's great. I, I definitely recommend reading the book. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me on, Laura. That was Michael Schellenberger. He's the author of the new book, Apocalypse Never, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. Change starts now. This is the Zero Waste Countdown Podcast.